Volume 1 Chapter 4 The next day Lord Raymond called at Perdita's cottage on his way to Windsor Castle. My sister's heightened color and sparkling eyes half revealed her secret to me. He was perfectly self-possessed. He accosted us both with courtesy, seemed immediately to enter into our feelings and to make one with us. I scanned his physiognomy, which varied as he spoke, yet was beautiful in every change. The usual expression of his eyes was soft, though at times he could make them even glare with ferocity. His complexion was colorless, and every trait spoke predominant self-will. His smile was pleasing, though disdain too often curled his lips, lips which to female eyes were the very throne of beauty and love. His voice, usually gentle, often startled you by a sharp discordant note, which showed that his usual low tone was rather the work of study than nature. Thus full of contradictions, unbending yet haughty, gentle yet fierce, tender and again neglectful, he by some strange art, found easy entrance to the admiration and affection of women, now caressing and now tyrannizing over them according to his mood, but in every change a despot. At the present time, Raymond evidently wished to appear amiable. Wit, hilarity, and deep observation were mingled in his talk, rendering every sentence that he uttered as a flash of light. He soon conquered my latent distaste. I endeavored to watch him and Perdita, and to keep in mind everything I had heard to his disadvantage. But all appeared so ingenuous, and all was so fascinating, that I forgot everything except the pleasure his society afforded me. Under the idea of initiating me in the scene of English politics and society of which I was soon to become a part, he narrated a number of anecdotes, and sketched many characters. His discourse, rich and varied, flowed on, pervading all my senses with pleasure, but for one thing he would have been completely triumphant. He alluded to Adrian, and spoke of him with that disparagement that the worldly wise always attach to enthusiasm. He perceived the cloud gathering, and tried to dissipate it, but the strength of my feelings would not permit me to pass thus lightly over this sacred subject. So I said emphatically, Permit me to remark that I am devotedly attached to the Earl of Windsor, he is my best friend and benefactor. I reverence his goodness, I accord with his opinions, and bitterly lament his present and I trust temporary illness. That illness, from its peculiarity, makes it painful to me beyond words to hear him mentioned, unless in terms of respect and affection. Raymond replied, but there was nothing conciliatory in his reply. I saw that in his heart he despised those dedicated to any but worldly idols. Every man, he said, dreams about something, love, honor, and pleasure. You dream of friendship, and devote yourself to a maniac. Well, if that be your vocation, doubtless you are in the right to follow it. Some reflections seemed to sting him, and the spasm of pain that for a moment convulsed his countenance checked my indignation. Happy are dreamers, he continued, so that they be not awakened. Would I could dream, but broad and garish day is the element in which I live. The dazzling glare of reality inverts the scene for me. Even the ghost of friendship has departed, and love, he broke off. Nor could I guess whether the disdain that curled his lip was directed against the passion or against himself for being its slave. This account may be taken as a sample of my intercourse with Lord Raymond. I became intimate with him, and each day afforded me occasion to admire more and more his powerful and versatile talents, that together with his eloquence, which was graceful and witty, and his wealth, now immense, caused him to be feared, loved, and hated beyond any other man in England. My descent, which claimed interest, if not respect, my former connection with Adrian, the favor of the ambassador, whose secretary I had been, and now my intimacy with Lord Raymond, gave me easy access to the fashionable and political circles of England. To my inexperience we at first appeared on the eve of a civil war. Each party was violent, acrimonious, and unyielding. Parliament was divided by three factions, aristocrats, democrats, and royalists. After Adrian's declared predilection to the republican form of government, the latter party had nearly died away, chiefless, guideless. But when Lord Raymond came forward as its leader, it revived with redoubled force. Some were royalists from prejudice and ancient affection, and there were many moderately inclined who feared alike the capricious tyranny of the popular party and the unbending despotism of the aristocrats. More than a third of the members ranged themselves under Raymond, and their number was perpetually increasing. The aristocrats built their hopes on their preponderant wealth and influence, the reformers on the force of the nation itself. The debates were violent, more violent the discourses held by each knot of politicians as they assembled to arrange their measures. 
Opprobrious epithets were bandied about, resistance even to the death threatened. Meetings of the populace disturbed the quiet order of the country. Except in war, how could all this end? Even as the destructive flames were ready to break forth, I saw them shrink back. Allayed by the absence of the military, by the aversion entertained by everyone to any violence, save that of speech, and by the cordial politeness and even friendship of the hostile leaders when they met in private society. I was from a thousand motives induced to attend minutely to the course of events, and watch each turn with intense anxiety. I could not but perceive that Perdita loved Raymond, methought also that he regarded the fair daughter of Verney with admiration and tenderness. Yet I knew that he was urging forward his marriage with the presumptive heiress of the Earldom of Windsor, with keen expectation of the advantages that would thence accrue to him. All the ex-Queen's friends were his friends, no week passed that he did not hold consultations with her at Windsor. I had never seen the sister of Adrian. I had heard that she was lovely, amiable, and fascinating. Wherefore should I see her? There are times when we have an indefinable sentiment of impending change for better or for worse, to arise from an event and be it for better or for worse, we fear the change and shun the event. For this reason I avoided this high-born damsel. To me she was everything and nothing. Her very name mentioned by another made me start and tremble. The endless discussion concerning her union with Lord Raymond was real agony to me. Methought that, Adrian withdrawn from active life, and this beauteous Idris, a victim probably to her mother's ambitious schemes, I ought to come forward to protect her from undue influence, guard her from unhappiness, and secure to her freedom of choice the right of every human being. Yet how was I to do this? She herself would disdain my interference. Since then I must be an object of indifference or contempt to her, better, far better avoid her, nor expose myself before her and the scornful world to the chance of playing the mad game of a fond, foolish Icarus. One day, several months after my return to England, I quitted London to visit my sister. Her society was my chief solace and delight, and my spirits always rose at the expectation of seeing her. Her conversation was full of pointed remark and discernment. In her pleasant alcove, redolent with sweetest flowers, adorned by magnificent casts, antique vases, and copies of the finest pictures of Raphael, Correggio, and Claude, painted by herself, I fancied myself in a fairy retreat untainted by and inaccessible to the noisy contentions of politicians and the frivolous pursuits of fashion. On this occasion, my sister was not alone, nor could I fail to recognize her companion. It was Idris, the till now unseen object of my mad idolatry. In what fitting terms of wonder and delight, in what choice expression and soft flow of language, can I usher in the loveliest, wisest, best? How in poor assemblage of words, convey the halo of glory that surrounded her, the thousand graces that waited unwearied on her. The first thing that struck you on beholding that charming countenance was its perfect goodness and frankness. Candor sat upon her brow, simplicity in her eyes, heavenly benignity in her smile. Her tall slim figure bent gracefully as a poplar to the breezy west, and her gait, goddess-like, was as that of a winged angel new alit from heaven's high floor. The pearly fairness of her complexion was stained by a pure suffusion, her voice resembled the low, subdued tenor of a flute. It is easiest perhaps to describe by contrast. I have detailed the perfections of my sister, and yet she was utterly unlike Idris. Perdita, even where she loved, was reserved and timid. Idris was frank and confiding. The one recoiled to solitude, that she might there entrench herself from disappointment and injury. The other walked forth in open day, believing that none would harm her. Wordsworth has compared a beloved female to two fair objects in nature, but his lines always appeared to me rather a contrast than a similitude. A violet by a mossy stone half hidden from the eye, fair as a star when only one is shining in the sky. Such a violet was sweet Perdita, trembling to entrust herself to the very air, cowering from observation, yet betrayed by her excellences, and repaying with a thousand graces the labor of those who sought her in her lonely bypath. Idris was as the star, set in single splendor in the dim anadem of balmy evening, ready to enlighten and delight the subject world, shielded herself from every taint by her unimagined distance from all that was not like herself akin to heaven. I found this vision of beauty in Perdita's alcove, in earnest conversation with its inmate. When my sister saw me she rose, and taking my hand said, He is here even at our wish, this is Lionel my brother. Idris arose also, and bent on me her eyes of celestial blue, and with grace peculiar said, You hardly need an introduction. 
we have a picture highly valued by my father, which declares at once your name. Verney, you will acknowledge this tie, and as my brother's friend, I feel that I may trust you. Then, with lids humid with a tear and trembling voice, she continued, Dear friends, do not think it strange that now, visiting you for the first time, I ask your assistance and confide my wishes and fears to you. To you alone do I dare speak. I have heard you commended by impartial spectators. You are my brother's friends, therefore you must be mine. What can I say? If you refuse to aid me, I am lost indeed. She cast up her eyes, while wonder held her auditors mute. Then, as if carried away by her feelings, she cried, My brother, beloved ill-fated Adrian, how speak of your misfortunes? Doubtless you have both heard the current tale, perhaps believe the slander, but he is not mad. Were an angel from the foot of God's throne to assert it, never, never would I believe it. He is wronged, betrayed, imprisoned. Save him, Verney, you must do this. Seek him out in whatever part of the island he is immured. Find him, rescue him from his persecutors, restore him to himself, to me. On the wide earth I have none to love but only him. Her earnest appeal, so sweetly and passionately expressed, filled me with wonder and sympathy. And when she added, with thrilling voice and look, Do you consent to undertake this enterprise? I vowed, with energy and truth, to devote myself in life and death to the restoration and welfare of Adrian. We then conversed on the plan I should pursue, and discussed the probable means of discovering his residence. While we were in earnest discourse, Lord Raymond entered unannounced. I saw Perdita tremble and grow deadly pale, and the cheeks of Idris glow with purest blushes. He must have been astonished at our conclave, disturbed by it I should have thought, but nothing of this appeared. He saluted my companions, and addressed me with a cordial greeting. Idris appeared suspended for a moment, and then with extreme sweetness she said, Lord Raymond, I confide in your goodness and honor. Smiling haughtily, he bent his head and replied with emphasis, Do you indeed confide, Lady Idris? She endeavored to read his thought, and then answered with dignity, As you please, it is certainly best not to compromise oneself by any concealment. Pardon me, he replied, if I have offended. Whether you trust me or not, rely on my doing my utmost to further your wishes, whatever they may be. Idris smiled her thanks and rose to take leave. Lord Raymond requested permission to accompany her to Windsor Castle, to which she consented, and they quitted the cottage together. My sister and I were left, truly like two fools, who fancied that they had obtained a golden treasure, till daylight showed it to be lead, two silly luckless flies who had played in sunbeams and were caught in a spider's web. I leaned against the casement and watched those two glorious creatures, till they disappeared in the forest glades, and then I turned. Perdita had not moved, her eyes fixed on the ground, her cheeks pale, her very lips white, motionless and rigid, every feature stamped by woe. She sat half-frightened. I would have taken her hand, but she shudderingly withdrew it and strove to collect herself. I entreated her to speak to me. Not now, she replied, nor do you speak to me, my dear Lionel. You can say nothing, for you know nothing. I will see you tomorrow, in the meantime, adieu. She rose and walked from the room, but pausing at the door and leaning against it as if her over-busy thoughts had taken from her the power of supporting herself, she said, Lord Raymond will probably return. Will you tell him that he must excuse me today, for I am not well? I will see him tomorrow if he wishes it, and you also. You had better return to London with him. You can there make the inquiries agreed upon concerning the Earl of Windsor and visit me again tomorrow before you proceed on your journey. Till then, farewell she spoke falteringly and concluded with a heavy sigh i gave my assent to her request and she left me i felt as if from the order of the systematic world i had plunged into chaos obscure contrary unintelligible that raymond should marry idris was more than ever intolerable yet my passion though a giant from its birth was too strange wild and impracticable for me to feel at once the misery i perceived in perdita how should i act she had not confided in me i could not demand an explanation from raymond without the hazard of betraying what was perhaps her most treasured secret i would obtain the truth from her the following day in the meantime but while i was occupied by multiplying reflections lord raymond returned he asked for my sister and i delivered her message after musing on it for a moment he asked me if i were about to return to london and if i would accompany him i consented he was full of thought and remained silent during a considerable part of our ride. At length he said, I must apologize to you for my abstraction. The truth is, Ryland's motion comes on tonight, and I am considering my reply. Ryland was the leader of the popular party, a hard-headed man, and in his way eloquent. 
He had obtained leave to bring in a bill making it treason to endeavor to change the present state of the English government and the standing laws of the Republic. This attack was directed against Raymond and his machinations for the restoration of the monarchy. Raymond asked me if I would accompany him to the house that evening. I remembered my pursuit for intelligence concerning Adrian, and knowing that my time would be fully occupied, I excused myself. Nay, said my companion, I can free you from your present impediment. You are going to make inquiries concerning the Earl of Windsor. I can answer them at once. He is at the Duke of Athol's seat at Dunkeld. On the first approach of his disorder, he traveled about from one place to another, until, arriving at that romantic seclusion, he refused to quit it, and we made arrangements with the Duke for his continuing there. I was hurt by the careless tone with which he conveyed this information, and replied coldly, I am obliged to you for your intelligence, and will avail myself of it. You shall, Verney, said he, and if you continue of the same mind, I will facilitate your views, but first witness, I beseech you, the result of this night's contest, and the triumph I am about to achieve if I may so call it, while I fear that victory is to me defeat. What can I do? My dearest hopes appear to be near their fulfillment. The ex-queen gives me Idris. Adrian is totally unfitted to succeed to the earldom, and that earldom in my hands becomes a kingdom. By the reigning God it is true, the paltry earldom of Windsor shall no longer content him, who will inherit the rights which must forever appertain to the person who possesses it. The countess can never forget that she has been a queen, and she disdains to leave a diminished inheritance to her children. Her power and my wit will rebuild the throne, and this brow will be clasped by a kingly diadem. I can do this, I can marry Idris. He stopped abruptly, his countenance darkened, and its expression changed again and again under the influence of internal passion. I asked, Does Lady Idris love you? What a question, replied he laughing. She will of course, as I shall her, when we are married. You begin late, said I ironically. Marriage is usually considered the grave and not the cradle of love. So you are about to love her, but do not already? Do not catechize me, Lionel. I will do my duty by her, be assured. Love, I must steal my heart against that, expel it from its tower of strength, barricade it out. The fountain of love must cease to play, its waters be dried up, and all passionate thoughts attendant on it die, that is to say, the love which would rule me, not that which I rule. Idris is a gentle, pretty, sweet little girl. It is impossible not to have an affection for her, and I have a very sincere one, only do not speak of love. Love, the tyrant and the tyrant queller, love, until now my conqueror, now my slave, the hungry fire, the untamable beast, the fanged snake, no, no, I will have nothing to do with that love. Tell me, Lionel, do you consent that I should marry this young lady? He bent his keen eyes upon me, and my uncontrollable heart swelled in my bosom. I replied in a calm voice, but how far from calm was the thought imaged by my still words? Never, I can never consent that Lady Idris should be united to one who does not love her because you love her yourself. Your lordship might have spared that taunt. I do not dare not love her. At least, he continued haughtily, she does not love you. I would not marry a reigning sovereign were I not sure that her heart was free, but oh, Lionel, a kingdom is a word of might, and gently sounding are the terms that compose the style of royalty. Were not the mightiest men of the olden times kings? Alexander was a king. Solomon, the wisest of men, was a king. Napoleon was a king. Caesar died in his attempt to become one, and Cromwell, the Puritan and King Killer, aspired to regality. The father of Adrian yielded up the already broken scepter of England. But I will rear the fallen plant, join its dismembered frame, and exalt it above all the flowers of the field. You need not wonder that I freely discover Adrian's abode. Do not suppose that I am wicked or foolish enough to found my purpose sovereignty on a fraud, and one so easily discovered as the truth or falsehood of the Earl's insanity. I am just come from him. Before I decided on my marriage with Idris, I resolved to see him myself again, and to judge of the probability of his recovery. He is irrecoverably mad. I will not detail to you, continued Raymond, the melancholy particulars. You shall see him, and judge for yourself. Although I fear this visit, useless to him, will be insufferably painful to you. It has weighed on my spirits ever since. Excellent and gentle as he is even in the downfall of his reason, I do not worship him as you do, but I would give all my hopes of a crown and my right hand to boot to see him restored to himself. His voice expressed the deepest compassion. 
Thou most unaccountable being, I cried, whither will thy actions tend in all this maze of purpose in which thou seemest lost? Whither indeed? To a crown, a golden bee-gemmed crown, I hope, and yet I dare not trust, and though I dream of a crown and wake for one, ever and anon a busy devil whispers to me that it is but a fool's cap that I seek, and that were I wise, I should trample on it, and take in its stead, that which is worth all the crowns of the East and presidentships of the West. And what is that? If I do make it my choice, then you shall know, at present I dare not speak, even think of it. Again he was silent, and after a pause turned to me laughingly, when scorn did not inspire his mirth, when it was genuine gaiety that painted his features with a joyous expression, his beauty became super-eminent, divine. Bernie, said he, my first act when I become King of England, will be to unite with the Greeks, take Constantinople, and subdue all Asia. I intend to be a warrior, a conqueror. Napoleon's name shall veil to mine, and enthusiasts, instead of visiting his rocky grave and exalting the merits of the fallen, shall adore my majesty and magnify my illustrious achievements. I listened to Raymond with intense interest, could I be other than all ear, to one who seemed to govern the whole earth in his grasping imagination, and who only quailed when he attempted to rule himself. Then on his word and will depended my own happiness, the fate of all dear to me. I endeavored to divine the concealed meaning of his words. Perdita's name was not mentioned, yet I could not doubt that love for her caused the vacillation of purpose that he exhibited. And who was so worthy of love as my noble-minded sister, who deserved the hand of this self-exalted king more than she whose glance belonged to a queen of nations, who loved him as he did her, notwithstanding that disappointment quelled her passion and ambition held strong combat with his. We went together to the house in the evening. Raymond, while he knew that his plans and prospects were to be discussed and decided during the expected debate, was gay and careless. And hum, like that of ten thousand hives of swarming bees, stunned us as we entered the coffee room. Knots of politicians were assembled with anxious brows and loud or deep voices. The aristocratical party, the richest and most influential men in England, appeared less agitated than the others, for the question was to be discussed without their interference. Near the fire was Ryland and his supporters. Ryland was a man of obscure birth and of immense wealth, inherited from his father, who had been a manufacturer. He had witnessed, when a young man, the abdication of the king and the amalgamation of the two houses of lords and commons. He had sympathized with these popular encroachments, and it had been the business of his life to consolidate and increase them. Since then, the influence of the landed proprietors had augmented, and at first Ryland was not sorry to observe the machinations of Lord Raymond, which drew off many of his opponent's partisans. But the thing was now going too far. The poorer nobility hailed the return of sovereignty as an event which would restore them to their power and rights now lost. The half-extinct spirit of royalty roused itself in the minds of men, and they, willing slaves, self-constituted subjects, were ready to bend their necks to the yoke. Some erect and manly spirits still remained, pillars of state, but the word republic had grown stale to the vulgar ear, and many, the event would prove whether it was a majority, pined for the tinsel and show of royalty. Ryland was roused to resistance. He asserted that his sufferance alone had permitted the increase of this party. But the time for indulgence was past, and with one motion of his arm he would sweep away the cobwebs that blinded his countrymen. When Raymond entered the coffee room, his presence was hailed by his friends almost with a shout. They gathered round him, counted their numbers, and detailed the reasons why they were now to receive an addition of such and such members who had not yet declared themselves. Some trifling business of the house having been gone through, the leaders took their seats in the chamber. The clamor of voices continued, till Ryland arose to speak, and then the slightest whispered observation was audible. All eyes were fixed upon him as he stood, ponderous of frame, sonorous of voice, and with a manner which, though not graceful, was impressive. I turned from his marked iron countenance to Raymond, whose face, veiled by a smile, would not betray his care. Yet his lips quivered somewhat, and his hand clasped the bench on which he sat with a convulsive strength that made the muscles start again. Ryland began by praising the present state of the British Empire. He recalled past years to their memory. The miserable contentions which in the time of our fathers arose almost to civil war, the abdication of the late king, and the foundation of the republic. He described this republic, showed how it gave privilege to each individual in the state to rise to consequence and even to temporary sovereignty. He compared the royal and republican spirit, showed how the one tended to enslave the minds of men, 
while all the institutions of the other served to raise even the meanest among us to something great and good, he showed how England had become powerful and its inhabitants valiant and wise by means of the freedom they enjoyed. As he spoke, every heart swelled with pride, and every cheek glowed with delight to remember that each one there was English, and that each supported and contributed to the happy state of things now commemorated. Ryland's fervor increased, his eyes lighted up, his voice assumed the tone of passion. There was one man, he continued, who wished to alter all this and bring us back to our days of impotence and contention. One man who would dare arrogate the honor which was due to all who claimed England as their birthplace and set his name and style above the name and style of his country. I saw at this juncture that Raymond changed color. His eyes were withdrawn from the orator and cast on the ground. The listeners turned from one to the other, but in the meantime the speaker's voice filled their ears. The thunder of his denunciations influenced their senses. The very boldness of his language gave him weight. Each knew that he spoke truth, a truth known but not acknowledged. He tore from reality the mask with which she had been clothed, and the purposes of Raymond, which before had crept around, ensnaring by stealth, now stood a hunted stag, even at bay. As all perceived who watched the irrepressible changes of his countenance, Ryland ended by moving, that any attempt to re-erect the kingly power should be declared treason, and he a traitor who should endeavor to change the present form of government. Cheers and loud acclamations followed the close of his speech. After his motion had been seconded, Lord Raymond rose, his countenance bland, his voice softly melodious, his manner soothing. His grace and sweetness came like the mild breathing of a flute after the loud, organ-like voice of his adversary. He rose, he said, to speak in favor of the honorable member's motion with one slight amendment subjoined. He was ready to go back to old times and commemorate the contests of our fathers and the monarch's abdication. Nobly and greatly, he said, had the illustrious and last sovereign of England sacrificed himself to the apparent good of his country and divested himself of a power which could only be maintained by the blood of his subjects. These subjects named so no more, these, his friends and equals, had in gratitude conferred certain favors and distinctions on him and his family forever. An ample estate was allotted to them, and they took the first rank among the peers of Great Britain. Yet it might be conjectured that they had not forgotten their ancient heritage, and it was hard that his heir should suffer alike with any other pretender, if he attempted to regain what by ancient right and inheritance belonged to him. He did not say that he should favor such an attempt, but he did say that such an attempt would be venial, and if the aspirant did not go so far as to declare war and erect a standard in the kingdom, his fault ought to be regarded with an indulgent eye. In his amendment he proposed, that an exception should be made in the bill in favor of any person who claimed the sovereign power in right of the earls of Windsor. Nor did Raymond make an end without drawing in vivid and glowing colors the splendor of a kingdom in opposition to the commercial spirit of republicanism. He asserted that each individual under the English monarchy was then, as now, capable of attaining high rank and power, with one only exception, that of the function of chief magistrate, higher and nobler rank than a bartering, timorous commonwealth could afford. And for this one exception, to what did it amount? The nature of riches and influence forcibly confined the list of candidates to a few of the wealthiest, and it was much to be feared that the ill humor and contention generated by this triennial struggle would counterbalance its advantages in impartial eyes. I can ill record the flow of language and graceful turns of expression, the wit and easy raillery that gave vigor and influence to his speech. His manner, timid at first, became firm, his changeful face was lit up to superhuman brilliancy, his voice, various as music, was like that enchanting. It were useless to record the debate that followed this harangue, party speeches were delivered, which clothed the question in cant, and veiled its simple meaning in a woven wind of words. The motion was lost. Ryland withdrew in rage and despair, and Raymond, gay and exulting, retired to dream of his future kingdom.